Mr. Lise. Now we will open the floor for some questions. Um, before we proceed, uh, we would just like to remind everyone to please state your name and your affiliation for documentation purposes. And can we keep it brief so we can accommodate more questions? Okay? So who would like to shoot the first question? Yes, sir. <laughs> Afternoon. Uh, I am being the last columnist from British World. Um, my, my question is, um, you, you painted a very um, um, be beautiful uh, picture for solar. So my question is, would you be willing to sponsor uh, for the abolition of the RA law? Because the RA law is a recognition that solar and wind are just special. That's, no, no, I, I have a question. Okay. So, would you, because otherwise, if you, if, if, if you sustain if a lot of RA law, is just to subsidize people to be able to speak, like uh, being tariff, um, RPF, uh, scheme, etc. So, if you say no, then that way invalidate many of the good points that you pointed out. Second, if you propose there will be large, large scale use of solar, then you're proposing large scale deforestation of the Philippines. What the main enemy of solar is saying? Shade from cloud, shade from trees. In fact, in your picture, so in your in solar plant, you cannot see a single tree. So if you have large, large, large scale plantation of solar, you have large scale outside deforestation model of trees. So how do you reconcile that? Thank you. On your first question, perhaps others may view that as a rhetorical one, but I take it seriously. I would support the abolition of the RE law if it came with the abolition of Epira. You know, the, the reason why we're in the mess that we are is because we have so much regulation in, in, the, in this uh, industry and why it's so difficult for us who have very cheap power to extend this to end users. You know, if, if you were just allowed to build distributed generation facilities without needing to be regulated, with solar storage and diesel being cheaper than the cheapest electric utility in the Philippines, we don't need any regulation. We can just have very cheap electricity for all Filipinos. So, if we just removed all regulation, then you'd see the penetration for solar increase in the Philippines far faster than it currently is. And that you would also uh, do away with any of the uh, provisions like fuel pass through and the, all, all the existing PSAs that utilities have that are burdening consumers due to overpriced coal and especially gas contracts. So, on the second question, um, we we've actually have a few trees in the middle of our solar panels. Yeah, so, one proposal we actually have is for the requirement on land conversion to be waived for solar plants if they will have multi-cropping solar farm and uh, fruit and vegetable farm underneath the panels. Because in China and Japan, where land is scarce in some regions, they're now using bifacial modules where the uh, panels will have sun um, passing through them elevated two meters above the ground that will allow people to still use crops uh, underneath the panels. So it's an easy solution to your problem. Uh, but again, there's at least 30 to 50,000 hectares of unproductive land in the zone that will be converted into solar farms. And the DAR would not allow us in any case to use any truly productive land for uh, solar installation. Yes, sir. Solar hits shade. And, and the purpose of trees is to give shades. Trees and solar are, are, are directly opposed to each other. It's okay, sir. So uh, you, you find that given the angle of a, of a tree adjacent to a solar panel, it will only be at, let's say, 5 p.m. or 7 a.m., where that angle is really going to block sunlight and most of your harvest is really when the sun is directly above your solar installation. So, for a minimal reduction in your energy output, you can go away with cutting any trees. 
Sir, we have the second question. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Arvin Guanaco from the Center for Energy and Community Development, C. Uh, thank you for your presentation and thank you for the insights you've shared today. Uh, I was just uh, wondering, uh, first, uh, how uh, we, we have seen an example of uh, how solar, uh, what solar meant for people uh, in uh, who are relying on electric cooperatives which, uh, with high costs and uh, well, as you said, uh, experience outages as a pack of life. Uh, can you go into deeper what solar could mean for urban uh, housing uh, or urban uh, people, of, uh, people in urban settings and how could they uh, actually benefit from the use of solar technology. Uh, secondly, what are the barriers for a lot of people are already on the grid uh, that uh, actually would want cheaper electricity but uh, are, are, are kept uh, virtually from accessing cer certain uh, from accessing solar. If it's not the cost, then what is keeping them from actually availing of the technology? That's it, thank you. So, on your first question, solar rooftop installations are, of course, an option for people in urban areas, and especially for homes where your energy consumption is relatively small relative to your rooftop space. With batteries, most homes can go off-grid. For large rooftop commercial industrial establishments, a significant portion of the electricity can also be uh, sourced from on-site generation. But to go uh, to a very high penetration of RE in Metro Manila, for example, it will really depend on either the utility contracting with solar plants, with an advantage being if they are embedded so that you will save on transmission costs, with there being a lot of available land in the surrounding provinces of Metro Manila, that such utility could indeed source the majority of its power from embedded RE plants. So that would be the fastest way to scale that. Or if retail competition open access is just made available for everyone, then you can buy solar power directly from us at a rate that is at least 30% lower than what you are currently paying. So that's what the green energy option is for. You can choose to, to, to buy your power from a cheaper source. Regarding what the barriers are, it's really just regulation, regulation, regulation. And um, that, that, that calls to, to mind a, a wonderful line that the Morocco Energy Sourcing Department had once told me, where they said there's only three things that matter in procuring energy. Price, price, and price. So you'd hope that we'd already have a a very high penetration of solar in the Philippines. Because that price would really be the only barrier. But the, the lack of competition due to the TRO against the implementation of ARCOA and due to the subversion of the competitive selection process rules which allows gas and other forms of fossil fuel to be advantaged over solar uh, is, is the reason why we don't have more solar in the grid. Thank you. Okay. So, questions? More questions from our students? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Should I give the mic to Sir Miller? Sir, can I give the gentleman over there? Hi, I'm Mimi, from the University of Philippines. My question is regarding the visibility of the independence of Philippines from the fossil fuel based mm, energy because if the Philippines has this set up of having the majority of its season of being rain and being rain and just um, sunny and also most of our time is just uh, of, uh, the set of the day is just 12 hours of being exposed to the sun and 12 hours of being uh, out of the sun will there be a time that the Philippines will be solely dependent on solar technology only? The wonderful thing is that we have a, a lot of existing 
coal and gas plants and diesel plants and many more under construction. So let's put peg that at 20 gigawatts. So even if all new supply that comes into the Philippine grid starting past the point of those that are already construction today would be solar, then it will still just be 30 to 50 percent of our energy supply for the foreseeable future. So I, I think that's that's a, a, a simple answer to that question. And and, and as for um, okay, ultimately, how high can the penetration become on on a level of daily intermittency? Storage will of course solve that because the output of these solar farms will be stable, reliable power. But you make a good point about the seasonal variation. That, however, is not as pronounced as people expect. Because if you don't have just one location where if a cloud passes by over a day, you have a dip in supply, but have 100 locations for these solar farms across Luzon, then when there's clouds in Bicol, there's not clouds in Cagayan, and there's not necessarily clouds in Batangas. So if you average out the output of all of those solar farms, it'll be a lot smoother than might otherwise have been expected. And thirdly, that the uh, degree to which existing capacity can, can be flexible uh, would also, of course, augment any shortfall in supply on a rainy day. And fourthly, I, I, I think that the advent of other forms of storage, like hydrogen, for example, which would allow you to store a lot of solar energy on a rainy uh, for use on a summer month, would mean that before we actually run into uh, structural shortfalls in solar supply that cannot be addressed by uh, these aforementioned factors, we'd have other forms of storage that would allow us to have uh, more seasonal uh, shifts in energy rather than daily shifts. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, can you share your experience in uh, getting solar project, uh, projects financed? Because apparently here in the Philippines, uh, while local banks have uh, been very helpful in financing traditional projects, uh, uh, I don't see the same enthusiasm in solar projects. So but can, can you share some insights how, how to get Capital for power projects like solar, uh, more for time from the houses. I, I, I think that that is too quick of a conclusion because there is such a small sample size of solar projects to begin with. So the history of solar to date has been the feed in tariff, and there were specific issues with the feed in tariff that made banks unwilling to finance those during construction until they got the offtake. But if you have a contracted solar project, there really should be no uh, issue, because after all, um, esteemed utilities like Maranco have wonderful credit, and it's really not a technology risk, it's really just an offtake risk. But the uh, other issue that distributed solar in particular will face will just be the tediousness of having to finance these smaller installations one at a time. So if you have a 600 megawatt thermal facility, then the time and cost of financing it is minuscule. But if you have a megawatt rooftop or even home rooftop installations, then it doesn't really make sense. And I think a solution to that is just financing them first on one's own balance sheet, and then refinancing it as a portfolio, which is what we have done for our commercial rooftop products to date. That being said, uh, I, I would hope that uh, both the processing time would be faster, considering that this is in fact a, a lower risk and far simpler thing to finance than a thermal plant, and that uh, rates could also be uh, more beneficial for RE plants, considering that RE plants have the lowest risk of being stranded because we don't have a marginal cost. But the, the, the cost of financing is a disproportionately important factor for the competitiveness of an RE plant because it's all capital and no fuel. Okay, so we can have our last question. Uh, okay, uh, could you kindly make your question a little clearer? So we can come with the of you. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris from Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. 
Um, as mentioned before, he said that the maximum penetration in the foreseeable future, even if all of the solar is implemented, is around 50% due to all existing contracts. Um, do you see any form of solution to that? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, those contracts will all fall away within the next 10 years when ARCOA is implemented. And those existing plants will be the backup for solar plants. So thank you to the owners of the gas plants. But the uh, limit will be reached when the difference in a whole portfolio of solar plants on a cloudy day uh, versus a sunny day would be greater than the degree to which all those other plants can be flexible. Which also is also augmented by the variation in hydro supply, which is converse to the availability of solar supply. But uh, again, um, to the extent that there are upcoming forms of storage that will allow you to store electricity not just daily but seasonally, such as through an electrolyzer that will put all of this electricity into vats of hydrogen that could be uh, recharged months later, then we would have a almost 100% solar energy mix past the time that the existing supply would be insufficient for backup. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Nelly Dominguez from Mirado. Um, in your Occidental Mindoro uh, solar uh, storage um, example, you mentioned that your true cost of generation is around 8 to 9 pesos per kilowatt hour, which is um, uh, really cheaper than NGCP's true cost of around 20 pesos per kilowatt hour. Um, but uh, my question is, uh, with the cost trajectory, trajectory of solar and batteries that we're seeing today, um, when do you expect um, solar storage um, reaching parity with the grid? So, uh, I will have to clarify that. 8 pesos is the cost for a small remote town with a diesel backup. And a cost for a large solar battery installation today would be around six pesos. But we wouldn't install that, insta that, that system today, given how long it takes to get a PSA, get regulatory approval, and public financing. The soonest COD for a newly conceived solar battery plant would be 2020 to 2022. In which case, the cost would be in the ballpark of five pesos. So for all intents and purposes, I think you can peg the solar battery storage cost at around five pesos per kilowatt hour. And of course, uh, perhaps competition will see even lower prices than that uh, in the future. Same question. Same question. Well, although I would think that the uh, lowest possible cost uh, mix of energy would be allowing solar to be supplied very cheaply all day and in the early evening, and then sourcing the off-peak from the Wesson, so that rather than five pesos, which is the cost for true physically generated electricity without any market trading, you could have three plus pesos for this bulk of the requirement, and one to two pesos for your off-peak, so you could truly have three pesos solar storage with WESM uh, 24 hours of life. Because there's no point generating electricity at three pesos and spending four pesos or so to shift it to night time when the power at WESM in that time will be, let's say, two pesos anyway. Thank you very much, Mr. From our participants. Again, let's um, give him a round of applause. Thank you so much for that very really important presentation. And again, we'd like to thank everyone for attending the last session of our evening lecture series. We also thank the Solar Philippines for um, partnering with us today. Um, can you stay for uh, some refreshments? Um,